we need cartoonists in the world. We need cartoonists for political cartooning. We need cartoonists to challenge authority. And we need cartoonists to make us laugh. Welcome to Talking About Kids. I'm your host, R. Bradley Snyder, researcher, activist, and author of The Five Simple Truths of Raising Kids. Incorporating the arts into education helps students succeed academically and socially. But despite this, art programs continue to face cuts and even elimination. To help counter this, I enlisted the help of Art Roach. If you've been a fan of animation in the last 20 years, then it's likely you have seen Art's work or work that he has supervised. Art created the Cartoon Network series Nacho Bear, and he continues to consult on Apple TV Plus's peanut series Camp Snoopy. But I asked Art on because of his two wonderful instructional children's books, Art for Kids, Cartooning, and Art for Kids, Comic Strips. If your kids are not getting enough opportunities to be creative, art can help you get them drawing. This podcast was sponsored in part by the Arizona Department of Health Services' Must Stop Bullying campaign, through its Title V Maternal and Child Health Program. For more information, go to muststopbullying.org. And now, the interview. I started drawing when I was about eight years old, and I always uh, drew cartoons and always watched cartoons on, on TV. So, I mean, I credit that a lot with my interest in, in animation and drawing and storytelling. Um, and, uh, my great goal all the way through school was to have a comic strip, like in the, in the tradition of peanuts and Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And so all through high school and college, that's really what I was working towards is trying to get a comic strip in the newspapers. And we all, we all remember newspapers. There's a few of them (laughs) left, but, um, (laughs) um, so as I was trying my hardest to get a syndicated comic strip in newspapers, newspapers decided to uh, change their whole industry and began uh, dying off at a rapid rate. So, um, but I still loved cartooning. I still love storytelling and it has always driven what I did and the the jobs I was going after. And it always gave me pleasure in my own life too. And what do you think that in particular, like cartooning and comic strips, what do they, what do you think they do for people? I think they do a lot of things and particularly for kids. I think they do a lot of things that, um, you know, the thing about my books that I wrote to instruct kids on how to do comic strips is comic strips are kind of an amazing uh, medium because so they're usually told in squares and panels. And the thing that people just intuit about comic strips is between panel one and panel two time passes. And Mm. so one person talks, so they're, so they, they kind of exist on this, uh, you know, this, this level of time passing, but also you're telling a story and kids intuitively get that. I think adults intuitively get that, but I think it's always, to me, it's always been fascinating as a medium because you're, you're dealing with time and you're controlling time. And, and I've always loved that about it, about comic strips, but I think, comic strips and animation also in general can teach kids about obviously about drawing but it can t- tell them how to uh, teach them how to tell a story or mm. it teaches them that stories have a beginning a middle and an end uh it can teach them different the difference between good and evil uh it can also mm. develop a child's sense of humor or a sense of empathy uh with that character that they're seeing so I think, you know, it can do all these things. That's why I think it's great. That's a really interesting point that you bring because you're, you're absolutely right that there is a, the structure itself forces you to think about the story that you're telling in a way that if you just start on a page writing words, 
you might not get there, right? You might not realize, oh, that there, there's something that happens between this start and the end. And I need to figure out what that is on the journey. Right, right. Um, I think good children's programming is designed to explain the world to them in an appropriate mm -hmm. way. Um, I mean, I learned by watching Looney Tunes cartoons, and it, that might not be appropriate, but it was certainly <laughs> effective. Um, and it, it, it taught you a story arc from beginning to end. And repeated viewings of that, you began to get a, an innate sense for how stories develop and, and how to move stories along, as well as how to keep characters, how, how characters work and how writing characters work and how, how uh, you know, Bugs Bunny was taught me how to write a consistent character even mm. years later because Bugs Bunny's character never changes. So uh, it could teach so many things to, to, at the same time. That's what's just amazing to me. You mentioned character, and when when we first met, you were working at Cartoon Network, and mm -hmm. your work there, you know, I recall your perspective there, because I think we were both at Cartoon Network at a time when there was a tension between maybe snark and what I might describe as kind of like characters with deeper empathy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do, am I recalling that correctly, Art? Or, or like, there seemed to be this moment where we were there was this was happening. Like, you, we can do this thing, and it might be funny, but it might be a little bit mean. Mm -hmm. Or we can do this other thing that is maybe a little bit more respectful of the audience, although the payoff takes a little bit longer to get there. Yeah, I think, it, it, you know, character matters, and I think story matters to kids. And I think, um, you know, you you know much better than I the sort of the stages that a child goes through, and when there's five, six, and seven, and eight, they're kind of, mm. they're discovering that they're an individual person, and they're also discovering how the, the world works. So the the things that they see in that time frame are extremely important. I think Cartoon Network, um, <laughs> I don't want to speak for a whole network and all the creators at Cartoon Network, but I think it took a few years for the network and the creators in that network to realize the power they had and mm -hmm. also to kind of take their work up a notch to start putting more of that real world empathy into the characters they created. Yeah, I, you know, I've said it multiple times to multiple creators. I, I think it's actually harder to write yeah. for kids. And you and I have both encountered people in the kids space that didn't want to be there. You know, they wanted to be writing for Saturday Night Live or they mm -hmm. wanted to be writing for another adult property. And they looked at writing for kids as a dumbing down. And I think it's quite the opposite, actually. Right. And I, <laughs> I know you do, too. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, later in your career, you work and, and continue to work for Peanuts. And mm -hmm. if there's ever been a better example of a comic strip that was simple on the surface and profoundly deep, I don't know what it is. Peanuts <laughs> is an amazing property. You had to be excited to, to get to contribute there. Oh my gosh, so excited. It is. It was my number one property that I just loved growing up. I mean... I was, the, you know, it, to this day, there are, there are uh, parts of the Halloween special and the Christmas special that brings tears to my eyes. It's just, it, and, and the work that he did, that Charles M. Schultz did, uh, was fantastic. So to, be, to it, be able to work in that studio and the environment and to meet his family, I actually met him in person um, many, many years ago, just briefly, but I never got to work at the studio with him. He had passed away by then, but... Um, just to be involved with the family and the property and all those characters, it was, it was an amazing experience. And you're right. He wrote about real life and he wrote about the people around him and he wrote, and there was sadness and there was darkness. Uh, but there was also joy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well before it was popular to have books like the Tao of Pooh and, you right. know, the, these other books that, that, point out the wisdom in popular titles, I had found, and so I'm talking, this was published in the early 80s, I'd, I'd found this book that looked at existentialism 
I found mm -hmm. it in a, a bookstore in Ann Arbor, Michigan, hmm. that looked at kind of existentialism in the work of Charles Schultz. And it became, it, it, I really, at that time, I was actually very much involved in reading existentialism. And I would go from reading a book by Sartre to picking up one of the, uh, the kind of the dime store novel size collections <laughs> yes right of peanuts cartoons and i would work my way through that as a way to kind of process what i just read and it was all it was kind of all there these are all characters that are kind of trying to figure out what it means to be human the mm -hmm. joy of it the failure of it the you know the the relationships in it um and there there's a lot of silliness and and i know that there's silliness in your work as well mm -hmm. Um, talk a little bit about the importance of silliness sometimes. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you're trying to communicate um, to kids uh, what the world is like and what their world is like. And to a child, a lot of the world is silly. And you're trying, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to us if we think about it. So um, uh, it's a way to relate to a child and to have a, bring a, a, a child into the work and 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 also provide some relief and it's it's just like life it's it, you know the best lessons in life are a combination of dark and light and i think uh the best uh content for kids is the same and all the time that you're and our careers are intertwining i had yeah. no idea that you had been working on these two instructional books um art for kids cartooning um, and then art for kids comic strips. I, I don't think I even knew they existed until I was, I forget why I was looking for, I was trying to find where you were. Um, I'd followed you through a couple of moves and we'd worked together. And then, and when I was Googling you, I found your Amazon profile and I saw <laughs> these books, uh, immediately purchased them for my own kid. Um, what, what was kind of your goal in creating those books? I was approached by a friend at a small uh, publisher and, and she just kind of said, you know, have you ever thought about doing a cartooning book? Um, and at that point, as I said before, I had been trying to do a comic strip for so many years. I had submitted to syndicates probably 10 or 12 different ideas. And I just, I loved the idea. It didn't depress me that I never got, I actually got, I was under contract twice with a syndicated cartoon, but it, the, those never launched. So, I, I mean, I just kept trying and mm. trying and it didn't, uh, and I never got discouraged. So when this um, person offered, you know, a chance to do a cartooning book, I just sat down and said, well, I've worked really hard to figure this out. And what if I just dumped everything I knew and everything I figured out for myself into a book? for kids just to, you know, and, and maybe one or two kids would decide to be cartoonists. And to me, that would have been worth it if just one or two kids were lit up by what I wrote. So I just tried to pour everything I knew about cartooning, starting from the beginning into the first book, cartooning. Uh, the second book was more uh, targeted towards comic strips and more towards the writing and how to write a story and how to create characters and and good guys and bad guys and how to write a joke and why are jokes funny and <laughs> all these <laughs> existential things that I've, that all these, you know, things that I've thought about my whole life, I just tried to put down on paper. And you had been prior to that, and even probably as you were writing those books, you had been supervising other designers, adult designers, creating, um, you know, a, animation and, and stories for for kids but for mm -hmm. later for wider audiences um how what do you what do you think are the the tips the best things to do to kind of start off people drawing and um cartooning well um i think as parents we we need to watch our children and as parents we all want our kids to be happy and i think mm. uh everyone should be exposed to drawing and art programs by the age of five or six and earlier if possible um yeah. and you watch your kids and you watch kids and you see what lights them up and what makes them happy it, you know some kids will like arts art class uh and others not so much and at this stage i think it's really important 
that talent doesn't matter at this stage. And parents need right. to know that if the kid, if their child is happy and engaged, then they are a future artist. Uh, they don't need to worry about uh, what that what their child is producing. I think it's. I've always thought it was funny that you know kids will take a, a six or seven year old to their first baseball game, and you know they're they're not expected to be all stars. <laughs> you know you don't. <laughs> you know if they whiff off the tee ball, that's cool. You're still out. You're still in the stands cheering. So right. so don't expect your six year old to know how to draw a duck. Uh, right. It's just that, you know. And I think uh, it's their happiness that counts. And, and if they are turned on and if you see the light go on in their eyes when they're doing art or coloring, and if your school doesn't offer it, then, then you should ask them to offer it. And, if, and even then you should have an art time at home maybe um, and just see which kids light up when they're doing art. And those are the kids, you know, when you see a child light up, then you just expose them to as much art as you possibly can at that point. And that's how you get them hooked. Well, you know, one of the kind of primary tasks of childhood is to figure out kind of what it means to be an adult. Right. And those involve like really complicated questions and experiences. And what's interesting is that we, we you know, we kind of now know from psychology and social psychology and a little bit from the neurosciences that you know, we kind of process this, or we can. Art is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Drawing is one of the arts, but art is an opportunity for us to kind of process our own thoughts and our own feelings and help ourselves make sense right. of our own feelings and experiences. And obviously, artists have been telling this, us that for a really long time. Yeah. Um, but obviously, now, you know, the sciences are reinforcing that. So I can't agree with you more. It's, I think, absolutely essential that we give our children opportunities um, to, yeah. to practice arts and, and to be artistic. Well, I, I was going to say, and it's also true that some kids process their emotions by kicking a soccer ball. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like it's it's every child is different and you have to you have to pay attention. Yeah. And it's also the other thing, too, there's a there's a big myth out there art that we that each human has one way of learning this, this right. predominant learning style and it it's been obviously it's been widely debunked in scientific circles but it still finds its way into classrooms it still finds its way kind of into the popular zeitgeist and so every chance i get i will explain to people you know it it's very situational mm -hmm. sometimes we need to learn by being in kinesthetic. Sometimes we can learn by hearing. Sometimes we can learn by seeing. So it really depends on where we are at that right. time and what it is that we're trying to process. So it's a good tool to have in your tool belt, even if you are typically somebody that is a, a reader or a visual learner or you, you're good at auditory processing, having in your skill set the, the freedom, the ability uh, to, to sit down and draw is going to help you regardless yeah. right yeah. and you know all the all the evidence as you said about the motor skills and being able to transfer an image from your eyes to your brain to your hand it's just it's all you know the science is all there you know a big part of a you know serious art schooling as at least as i understand it and um obviously someone in your book is is replicating, is mm -hmm. being able to look at something. Um, and hopefully it's something that you have a desire to replicate. Uh, but what are some of the, the tricks of helping, if you've got a kid that really wants to be able to draw their favorite cartoon character, really wants to be able to draw their favorite anime star or you know a character from a movie, do you have tips for you know, helping that kid reach that goal? Well, I think first of all, it's important for um, to acknowledge that that copying someone else's character or your favorite character from a screen or a book is okay. That mm. is okay. That's how people start because you have an affinity for a character, you like that character, and then you want to draw that character. A lot of people, a lot of young artists, worry as they're draw as they're kind of 
drawing their favorite anime character that they worry that they won't develop their own style, but it really does take care of itself. So drawing and copying someone else's character is perfectly fine. I encourage students to do that whenever, whoever they want to. Um, I think just practice. I think you can, um, you know, what I try to do in my books is is trying to make the point that erasing and starting over is okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Doing a bad drawing the first time is okay. Uh, and what you're really trying to do is develop your own eye and your ability to, mm. to take what you're seeing and to draw it and, and to the motor skills it takes to draw it and put it down on paper. And that takes practice. That takes a lot of practice. But if you enjoy drawing and you enjoy art, that you're not, it's not going to feel like practice. And that's what I tell students is to just draw as many characters as you want, as often as you want. Sooner or later, your, your true style, your own personal style will come out in a drawing. It, it just takes time. I think that time is really important. I mean, and actually, in what you just described there is elements that my listeners will be familiar with uh, when we talk about um, that growth mindset. Mm. You know, sometimes we've, we've made a mistake in the past where we have uh, rewarded kids uh, in, in the wrong way, where we said, hey, everything that you're doing is perfect the way it is. And that has sometimes undermined their ability to fail and to set and work towards goals, right? So what we kind of believe or know now is that what we want to, we want kids to know that there are things that they're going to have to work for and that's okay right. because they can get there. It's a, it's a very different approach of saying everything you do right now is perfect <laughs> yeah. uh, versus, you know, you know, this is, this is where you are now and it's not where you need or want to be, but that's okay because he, you have the skills to get there. If you do things like you said, are like practice, um, you can get there with enough practice. Yeah. And it's a challenge for parents. And, and as I, I have two boys myself, they're grown now, but you know, it's a challenge for parents because they don't know how much to gush <laughs> when, right. when they're presented with a, a new drawing or a painting. Absolutely. Uh, do, is, you know, we've, we've kind of addressed this a little bit, but do you see other mistakes that either parents or educators make when they are uh, trying to encourage or, or help their kids or students draw? I mean, the, the most damaging thing I see is just negative feedback. I don't think there, mm. is, there is, I have never met an adult who says, oh, I'm not an artist. I've never met an adult who wasn't told at some point that a drawing was bad or that they're not an artist. Mm. People are told that. Um, and, and by the age of eight or nine or 10, I meet kids that say that, and it just breaks my heart because it just means that at some point, some well-meaning adult uh, made them feel bad about their art, and yeah. that lasts that lasts forever. Um, and so that's the most critical thing, and it's just, it's just it breaks my heart. Yeah, it, you know, it doesn't mean you have to gush over everything they do, but just you know, just let them enjoy the work that they're doing, and you know. I, I, you know, I tell people all the time, well, Picasso couldn't draw a horse either. Don't mm -hmm. worry about it. You know, and, and having supervised and worked with so many other visual artists over the years, um, how have you seen kind of that fear of feedback or have you seen that fear of feedback um, really uh, impact how some of your, your colleagues or the people that you were supervising work? Oh, you can tell. I mean, you really have to. I've I've had uh, people I work with who I've sort of had to build back up a little bit. But um, hmm. you know, if they're in the in the creative professions, uh, you know, al already, um, that it's usually not too bad. It's usually not too drastic. But um, but yeah, people people everybody takes feedback differently, and and the the more someone likes art really the more deeply they feel about it and you just have to be really careful about how you talk to them about their art you know i i got to talk with uh, you know early on in talking about kids i got to talk with Pete Johnson who you worked with at Cartoon Network about sure. his experience 
at Lego. And of course, he went into Lego already having a career at Cartoon Network and at Nickelodeon and at Saatchi. Um, but he still learned something when he got to, to Lego. And we talked about that a little bit. You'd already had you know, an a car- enviable career when you got to Peanuts. Um, what did you learn when you got there? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I was in uh, Peanuts was in an interesting place. I think a lot of kids know who Snoopy is, but a lot of um, young children don't really are are not familiar as familiar with the Peanuts characters. So yeah. for us, um, we tried to expose them to the character designs first because the they really and you know they they're obviously uh, kind of super appealing the character designs themselves. Um, and then kind of meet them with the content of the of the cartoon strips. Um, for a lot of kids, um, you know, the 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 gateway into Peanuts is animation and not comic strips, just because right. um, animation it speaks to them so much more now. So, which is why uh, with we had the series, the two uh, animated series on Apple TV, plus a couple of specials on Apple TV. It was so important for the Peanuts. Um, crew to get a uh, kind of modern animation going on on Apple TV. Well, it, it, there is also something that I've noticed with my own kid and having never worked for peanuts or done any testing for them in any sort of way, I don't know how this plays, but one of the things that I know I, I had to do with my own kid when we were watching the seasonal peanuts, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing way too much right now, Art, but I will only <laughs> allow for seasonal cartoons to play during their yes. season. <laughs> so, I'm with you on that. Right, because I grew up waiting yes. for the Charlie Brown specials right. to be on TV. Right. And so I, I didn't want, I wanted it to feel special. But the thing that I absolutely had to do was I had to k- kind of help my kid regulate because there's a lot of quiet yes. in every one of those original cartoons. Yes. I, I think it's powerful. We need more quiet. That's pretty, that's pretty agreed upon in the social sciences that we don't have these spaces mm-hmm. to kind of rejuvenate, relax, restore. Uh, but man, for a kid coming out of <laughs> you know, a, a more modern animation world, it, it takes some adjustment. Absolutely. And I want to tell you, it takes adjustment for the animators as well. <laughs> we, yeah. we um, you know, the first the studios, you know, when we started partnering with the studio for animation, we, you know, we would constantly have to tell them, slow down, slow down, because they were just, they were used to the pace. And, um, and that's not the pace that, that uh, Charles Schultz had in his comic strip. And we didn't want it to be the pace for animation. So we wanted the animation to to feel like the comic strips. And so, yeah, it's, it's a lot to get used to for, for a young person. Art, what's your vision for your books and your kind of contributions to helping kids become artists? What, what would you like to, how, how will you know if you've been successful? Gosh, I'm not sure I will know, but I, I, <laughs> I trust that if I put my work out there in the in the form of these two books that that kids will find it and hopefully I'm just I just want to light the fire under a few few people to be cartoonists uh, we need cartoonists in the world we need cartoonists for political cartooning we need cartoonists to challenge authority and we need cartoonists to make us laugh and so um, they're extremely important and I just I want to I want to make cartoonists that's that's my goal well, Art, what I can tell you is that over the years that, that we've worked together on and off, there have been times when I've been in the room and things were being debated. And if I ever found myself not already on your side, <laughs> I, always, I always found myself double checking uh, because you've always had the needs of kids um, center in your vision and in your work. And so if I ever thought, wait, I'm... I'm I might be disagreeing with art. I might be wrong. So I'm going to rethink my entire position <laughs> here. 
So I just want to thank you uh, for Absolutely. for everything. Thanks for being on Talking About Kids. Uh, yeah. It's been a real pleasure to connect. Oh, Brad, it's it's been so fun for me. And thank you. It's been great reconnecting with you. And thank, thanks for having me. This is great. That was Art Roach. For more information about Art and his wonderful books, please visit our website, talkingaboutkids.com. From there, you also can find out about upcoming episodes, suggest a topic, learn more about me and my books, or submit your questions for future guests. Our theme song is by The Senators. For more of their music, go to thesenatorsmusic.com. And remember, kids are young goats and young children. And the difference is that young goats are easier to manage. <laughs>